Hello students, welcome to the EPG Parshala. I am Ashok Goel from the Department of Physics and Astrophysics, University of Delhi. Today in this module, we will discuss the Gram-Schmidt theory, which is an important theory for integral equations. This theory will discuss in two parts in this module and in the next module, which form the part of the paper mathematical physics. So, students, let us see what we are going to learn in this module. In this module, we will learn the Gram Schmidt method in the context of solving integral equations, and then we will discuss the existence of at least one eigenvalue of the equation. Consider inhomogeneous integral equation f of x is equal to g of x plus lambda times integral a to b of the kernel k which is a function of x and y multiplied by the unknown function f of y dy where in this gx is a real function kxy is given and is real and we will assume it is a symmetric kernel which means k x of y is equal to k y of x and lambda is a number and we have to solve this equation for the unknown function f of x. The Hilbert Schmidt theory gives an elegant result for the solutions of this equation. Regarding the homogeneous equations, let us consider first the homogeneous version of the equation which we have seen earlier, which is the inhomogeneous fed home equation. If we put the inhomogeneous term g of x is equal to 0, then when a solution to the equation of the corresponding homogeneous equation exists, the value of lambda in this case is called an eigenvalue, and the corresponding solution, which is f of x, is called the eigenfunction corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda. We will first prove the orthogonality of the possible solutions of the equation when gx is equal to 0, that is for the homogeneous equation. Since we are considering a homogeneous integral equation with symmetric kernel, the equation is simply fx is equal to is lambda times integral a to b kxy multiplied by fy dy, where the kernel k is symmetric. So let fpx and fqx be solutions of this equation for the value of lambda equal to lambda p and lambda q respectively. That is fpx is equal to lambda p into the integral a to b dy kxy fpy and fqx is also equal to lambda q the integral a to b fy kxy fqy. Now we multiply this equation or fpq by fq star x and we take lambda p on the left hand side. So the left hand side becomes fq star fp, both functions are functions of x divided by 1 upon lambda p is integral a to b dy fq star kxy p of y. Now we take the complex conjugate of the second equation of fqx. So we have fq star x is equal to lambda q star integral a to b dy fq star of y kxy because we have assumed the kernel to be real also. Uh, this complex conjugate is k is itself. Now we multiply this equation by fpx and take the factor lambda q star to the left. So we get one upon lambda q star fq star x fp of x is equal to an integral a to b dy fq star of x into k which is a function of x and y multiplied by fp of x. Now these two equations which we have obtained, one equation of a product of the function fq star with fp, another product of the function fq star with fp again, one with lambda p in the denominator, another with lambda q star in the denominator. So we integrate this equation with respect to x. So on the right hand side, we get a double integral, an integral over 
x and an integral over y, the limits of both these integrals are from a to b, and we use the property that k the kernel is symmetric, that kxy is equal to ky, and we can now interchange in the integration variable x and y. Therefore, we obtain for the second equation we obtain one upon lambda q star, the integral of q star x f p x dx is equal to integral a to b dx and integral a to b dy f q star x k x y f p of x. And therefore, subtracting these two equations, we get 1 upon lambda p minus 1 upon lambda q star and integral a to b of the product of the function f q star x with f p from a to b equal to 0. Similarly, we can integrate the other equation over x and we get 1 upon lambda q star integral f q star f p x dx is equal to the integral over x and y double integral of the product of function f q star x k x y and f p y and again by interchanging the variables the order of integration can be reversed since the integrals are over finite range then we get using the fact that k x y is equal to k y x we get now 1 upon lambda q star multiplied by the integral of f q star x f p x dx is equal to a double integral or two dimensional integral over dx and dy over the range a and a to b for both f q star k x y f p x. Now the gram schmidt method consists that all solutions f p m can be normalized which means that the integral of the product of solutions. So, take any solution fpm. Normalization of the solution means that integral from a to b of the product fpm star fpm integrative over dx is equal to 1. Now, consider the combination fp alpha of x is equal to fp1 of x plus alpha times fp2 of x. Since alphas as yet are constant, Clearly, lambda p integral from a to b of k x y f p alpha d y can be written as by substituting for f p alpha in terms of f p one and f p two. So this becomes an integral, a sum of two integrals from a to b over d y. First integral is the integral for k x y multiplied by f p one. The second one is alpha times the integral of kxy multiplied by fp2. So, this we write as fp alpha x. That is fp alpha is also an eigenfunction with the eigenvalue 1 upon lambda p of the same homogeneous equation. Now, integral of the product fp alpha star x fp 1 x from a to b is equal to 1 plus alpha times an integral a to b of f p 2 star x f p 1 x dx where alpha is equal to 1 upon integral a to b f p 2 star x f p 1 x dx. But now we choose alpha to be this. So that for this choice of alpha the integral from a to b of f p alpha star x f p 1 star x dx is equal to 0. Why? Because remember the integral a to b of the product of two functions f p alpha star x into f p 1 x is equal to 1 plus alpha times integral of the product of the functions alpha p 2 f p 2 star f p 1. So, if, with this choice of alpha as minus 1 upon integral of product two functions f p 2 star f p 1 with this choice then this integral a to b f p alpha f p 1 dx become 0 and further integral from a to b or f p alpha star f p alpha x over dx is equal to 1 plus mod alpha square. So, that f p alpha x can be normalized by dividing it by 1 plus alpha mod square to the power half. Thus, the m degenerate solution can now be listed as f p 1 x f p alpha x sorry f p 1 x f p 2 x f p 3 x f p m x. This means f p 1, f p 2 are orthogonal and they are 
all normalized set of two with the rest of the functions being fp3 fpm the rest of the functions are normalized but they are not orthogonal to fp1 or fp alpha next we form the combination f alpha 3 is equal to fp alpha 3 plus alpha 2 times fp2 plus alpha 1 times fp1 where alpha and alpha 2 are yet to be specified then we have lambda p integral a to b k x y f p alpha 3 y dy we define as f of p alpha 3 x so that f p alpha 3 is a, also an eigenfunction of the kernel k x y with the same eigenvalue lambda p we can follow the same procedure as for p alpha we can choose alpha 2 alpha 1 such that f p of alpha n is orthogonal to both f p 1 and f p alpha we thus have a sequence of functions f p 1 x f p alpha x f p alpha 2 alpha f p m x where the three are orthogonal we can indefinitely carry on with this procedure till the m -th functions become orthonormal we thus have the result that irrespective of degeneracies we can always arrange that the eigenfunctions form an orthonormal set let us talk about the existence of eigenvalues we first prove that the homogeneous equation has at least one eigenvalue that is lambda for at least one value of lambda the equation has a non trivial solution which means fx is not identically zero solution now consider the quantity and the i which is defined as the product of three functions k x y f of x f of y integral dx dy using schwarz inequality i is less than or equal to integral a to b of k square x y dx dy multiply by the integral a b from a b of the square of the function f square x dx whole square since we are interested in functions that are bounded that is integral of f square dx between the limits a to b is less than infinity we can always normalize the function that fx satisfies because if they are bounded then there exists a finite number l and we can divide the function by under root of that to normalize it so in that case fx is normalized which means the integral f square x dx from a to b is equal to 1 since the kernel k x y is assumed real and bounded we conclude that the integral is bounded we will next prove that the integral can vanish if and only if k x y which is also a two dimensional integral from a to b of k x y multiplied by the product of f x plus f 1 with f y plus f 1 y then clearly i 2 is equal to i plus i 2 plus twice times from this we can see the i2 is equal to i plus i1 plus twice the integral from a to b over dx multiplied with integral an integral from a to b over dy of kxy f1x f2i that is a two dimensional integral of the product of the kernel kxy with the function f1 of x and f2 of y thus the integral i2 is equal to the integral i plus i1 plus 2 i12 and proving this we have used the symmetry property i1 i2 which are quadratic in form if they vanish then the integral i12 also vanishes if we now take f1x is equal to integral a to b of kxy into fy over dy we get i12 is equal to 0 is equal to integral a to b kxy fx dx multiply by the integral kyz f of z over dz dy which is equal to the integral dy from a to b and integral multiply by the integral of dx a to b kyx fx 
multiply the integral a to b dz kyz fz which is equal to the integral dy of a function square of the integral of kyx fx dx from a to b and hence the integral a to b kxy fx dx must be equal to zero because this is the quadratic form so this has to be zero fx so far is completely arbitrary thus the integral of a to b of kxy fx implies that the kernel xy is equal to zero we thus have proved the result that if integrals of the form i for arbitrary fx vanish then the kernel kxy is necessarily zero we now distinguish three cases if an integral is greater than zero for all f of x not equal to zero the kernel is said to be positive definite if the integral is less than zero always the kernel is called negative definite if the integral can be sometimes positive and sometimes negative the kernel is called definite so kernel is depends on the value of the integral whether it's positive negative kix that is k and x y we write as some over i and j from 1 to v n of k i j n multiplied by k i of x k j of y where k i j of n is k j i of n such that in the limit v n goes to infinity k and x y which is symmetric converges uniformly uniformly to k x y corresponding to i we define an integral i n which is the two dimension integral dx dy from a to b of k n x y multiplied by fx and fy since i n is bounded as proved earlier it has subject to the constraint of equation given in 9.28 so it has a maximum value i then the integral i n is written as a sum over i and j from 1 to v n of k i j n alpha i alpha j we will prove an inequality which is called the bessel's inequality we have the integral dx from a to b of the square of fx minus sigma i 1 to p alpha i k i x which is greater than or equal to 0 for any value of p expanding and using the orthonormal property of k i s this leads to that the integral a to b dx f square x minus twice sum over i to p integral a to b of alpha i k i x f x dx plus sum over i and sum over j from 1 to p of alpha i alpha j multiplied by the integral from a to b of k i x k j dx this is less than or equal to 0 and the right hand side is equal to then integral a to b dx f square x minus alpha i square summed over i from 1 to p is greater than or equal to sigma alpha i square i summed from 1 to p for any value of p hence the integral f square dx a to b is greater than or equal to sum of alpha i square where now i goes from 1 to vn this is bessel's inequality now alpha i is depend on fx that is if fx is multiplied by a number alpha i gets multiplied by the same number the left hand side of the equation is constrained by 1 clearly then the maximum value of i n is reach when the alphas or alpha i's reach their maximum possible value hence i n in equation 930 is to be maximized subject to sigma alpha i square i is equal to 1 to n is equal to 1 i where k 1 n is an undetermined constant k 1 n is easily determined using the equation above the maximum value of i n is 
सिग्मा ओवर आई एन जे फॉर्म वन टू वी एन के आई जे एन अल्फा आई अल्फा जे इज इक्वल टू के वन एन लेट एस कॉल द अल्फा आईज विच मैक्सिमाइज आई एन एज अल्फा आई मैक्स देन डिफाइन ए फंक्शन एफ एन एक्स इज इक्वल टू सम ओवर आई और अल्फा आई मैक्सिमम इन टू के आई एक्स दे सेटिस्फाई द इंटीग्रल ए टू बी डी एक्स of fn x k x minus alpha i maximum we have the equation 9.35 which reads the sum over j from 1 to vn of k i j n alpha j is equal to k1 n of alpha i now the maximizing function reads now this equation when we maximize then this would read sigma j is equal to 1 to n k i j n alpha j maximum is equal to k1 n into alpha i maximum now we multiply this equation by k i of x and sum the right hand side is then k1 of n sum or i is equal to j to v n alpha i max k i x which is then equal to k1 of n f n of x and multiplied by sum over i and j from 1 to v n k i j and k i x alpha j max which is in turn equal to sum over i and j from 1 to v n k i j of n k i of x and integral a to b of k j y f n y d y which then becomes nothing but an integral from a to b of k n x y f n y d y hence f of x is run upon k1 n integral from a to b of k n x y f n y d y f n y thus is an eigen function of k n x y with the correct characteristic value mu 1 n is equal to 1 upon k1 n we will now discuss the limiting value the degenerate form of the kernel k n x y in the limit n goes to infinity converges uniformly to k of x y hence the modulus of i minus i n square is less than or equal to modulus k minus k n square multiplied by b minus a whole square which is less than or equal to epsilon square b minus a whole square thus i n goes to i as n goes to infinity because n goes to infinity epsilon goes to zero hence in the limit n goes to infinity the sequence of characteristic values 1 upon k11 1 upon k12 etc have a limit 1 upon k1 is equal to lambda 1 and all the k1 ends lie below k1 this last statement is because k1 is the maximal value of i and k1n is the maximal value of in we have thus established that the sequence of function f(x) converges to a limit f1 of x and the equation converges to f1x is equal to lambda 1 integral a to b of kxy f1y dy we have thus proved that for a positive symmetric kernel there exists at least one eigen function f1 of x with eigen value lambda 1 so students let us summarize what we have learned in this module what we have learned is that when the kernel k of an integral equation f of x is equal to gx plus lambda a to b kxy fy dy with g kxy the non functions and the non function being f of x when gx k and f are real and the kernel is symmetric that is kxy is equal to kyx the hilbert schmidt theory gives an elegant result for the solution of the equation when the solution exists the value of lambda is called an eigen value and the corresponding solution f of x is called a eigen function corresponding to that eigen value irrespective of degeneracies the eigen functions can be arranged to form an orthonormal set for a positive symmetric kernel there exists 
at least one eigenfunction f of x with the eigenvalue lambda 1. Thank you.